Sure, well, it's our last, our last sermon in the Abraham series. Can you believe it? I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this. I was saying to Shireen, I've been preaching pretty much every Sunday since 2018, and I think this is probably my favorite series that I've ever preached. I've, I've learned more here than I think ever before. So looking forward to wrapping it up with this last sermon. It's exam season. Is anybody still writing exams at the moment, or has it come and gone? I think it's just about come and gone. Our theological students here at the college are writing exams at the moment, and so they're stressing a bit, I think. Some people love tests and exams. Most people hate them. And as we read this last passage of Scripture from Genesis, we're going to see Abraham going through a test, and I'm pretty sure he didn't enjoy it. Let's read from Genesis 22. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he, sent out, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. The two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. Thanks be to God for his precious word to us. My best test result ever was a 54%. It's not the highest mark I ever got, I got higher than that. But my best result ever was a 54%. I was studying music production out at a college in Pretoria And to be honest, I found it quite easy because I'm a very musical guy. So I flew through all the courses and I was cruising along. And at the beginning of the third year, I walked into a class named SSD, uh, Soundscape and Design or something like that. I can't even remember. And I couldn't do it. I could not do what they wanted us to do. I can write music, but I can't shape sounds. I couldn't care less about that stuff. So I started to really struggle, and I remember at one point I got up and I stormed out of the class a few weeks in, and the lecturer came to me and said, man, you're the top student here, but you're gonna fail. You're gonna fail your whole year if you don't pass this one class. You gotta pull it together. (laughs) So eventually I remember going to him after class and sitting and saying, you could please help me. And I I scraped through the year. I got got 54%. I think he may have given me a few percent just to make me pass. But you know what, it was my favorite mark. I, 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 as I said, I flew through the other stuff because it was easy, but that is the mark I'm most proud of because it took some, some blood, sweat, and tears to, to pass that subject. Tests, tests are a big part of our lives. We do these tests and exams uh, in our studies, of course, but in life, there are all sorts of tests and trials that take blood, sweat, and tears for us to get through. Abraham found it out that time. He found it out that he was going to be tested, and it's the same for us. 
In fact, friends, take note today that the promise of God, number one, is not just to bless us, but to test us. The promise of God is not just to bless us, but also to test us. Verse 22 says, sometime later, God tested Abraham. God tested him. He didn't tempt him, and I want you to know this. He didn't tempt him. God doesn't tempt us to do evil. It's always the evil one who tempts, but God does test us. You see, the point of a test is not to try to trip you up. It's not to try to mess you around. It's to give you an opportunity to prove how you've grown. Ask any teacher, I, I hope, what the point of a test is. They'll say it's not to mess the students around, it's to give them an opportunity to prove how they've grown, to prove how they've grown in their knowledge or their application skills or whatever it might be. A big part of Christian living is facing tests, opportunities for us to grow. In fact, the Bible is full of God testing people so that they might grow. Look at this in Exodus. We read this in Exodus chapter 20. Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid, God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Now this is literally just after God spoke the 10 commandments to the people in Exodus 20. And as he was speaking, there was thunder and lightning on this mountain and the people were starting to get afraid. And Moses says this, he says, don't be afraid. God is giving you a chance to prove yourself. God is not coming to frighten you and to threaten you. He's coming to give you a chance to be holy, to live the life that he's called you to live. God's tests are not meant to abuse us, but to give us the opportunity to live the holy life he's called us to. In fact, James, the brother of Jesus, wrote these words at the beginning of his letter to the New Testament church. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. God wants to produce Christ-like character in you. He wants you to grow and become more and more like Jesus. That's not gonna happen if you're just getting everything handed to you on a plate. But if God can test you and give you opportunities to persevere, you're gonna grow. What are you walking through at the moment? Think about your life at the moment. What tests have come your way? God's not trying to knock you. God's not trying to punish you and slam you. He's trying to grow you. He's trying to give you the chance to become the Christ-like person he's made you to be. Of course, maybe you don't feel tested at the moment. Maybe you're in cruise mode. Maybe you need to uh, hear what King David said to God. Look at what David wrote. He invited God's tests. In Psalm 26, test me, Lord. (laughs) No, No student goes to the teacher and says, give me another test. Well, maybe some do, I never did. Test me, Lord, try me, examine my heart and mind. Famously in Psalm 139, search me, God, know my heart, test me, know my anxious thoughts. That's faith, that's faith to go to God and say, give me a test because I want to prove myself. I want to be the person you've made me to be and so test me. Abraham faced a hard test and you know what, it made him a better man. God's promise is not just to bless you, it's to test you. And for Abraham, this meant having to pay a great price, number two, the price to keep walking with God. Do you remember in Genesis 12 when we started this series, the very first point I think of the first sermon was God calls us to sacrifice. He calls us to leave our our homelands and go where he calls us. We spoke about how hard it must have been for Abraham to leave his father's household and forge a new life. And we said God calls us each to do that in our own way. Abraham did that. He sacrificed and left it all behind and started again and he spent years following God and there was another sacrifice he had to make and there was another sacrifice he had to make. God kept calling him to another sacrifice. This must have been devastating to him. I read this during the week and I think having walked this journey for the last nine weeks, you know, I'm sort of in the middle of Abraham's story feeling what he's feeling a bit 
And last week we finally saw his son arrived and now this week he's been called to sacrifice his son. Can you imagine the devastation in his life when he heard this? In fact, if you read Genesis 22, verse two, we see the first instance of the word love in the Bible. God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love. How deeply he must have loved this boy. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering. Oh boy, that must have hurt. But friends, the truth is God often calls us to sacrifice things we love to move forward. Now this is a unique situation. There is no other instance of, in the Bible of God ever calling someone to do this. Please know God's not calling you to hurt anybody. All right, we can't take that lesson from this. That would be a very silly way to read this text. The point of the story is not so much to encourage us to, any, to do something violent, but the point is this. Are you willing to pay the price of sacrificing things you love to get closer to God? Not physically sacrificing anybody, but maybe paying the price of an earlier morning or a later night or a regular Sunday worship time. Maybe paying the price of giving where you want to hold on to yourself. Maybe paying the price of doing something that you don't really <laughs> feel you want to do, but God's calling you to it. One of the most startling things Jesus ever said was this in Luke chapter 14. If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be by disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be, cannot be my disciple. Now, all Bible scholars agree that this is hyperbole. Jesus is not calling you to hate anybody because that isn't what he taught ever. But he was saying in relation to your, or in contrast, rather in comparison, sorry, to your relationship with God, your other relationships should look like you emphasize them even less. What price are you willing to pay to follow God? You know, Christians come to church to worship when they could, they could be jawling, right? They could be sleeping on a Sunday morning. But they say, I choose to pay this price because I need to be there and that's gonna fulfill my soul. Christians pay the price of maybe not going out and doing things that other people do because here is where they find closeness with God. That's what Abraham's story illustrates to us. Are you willing to pay the price that it takes to get committed to God and to stay connected to him? I love that verse we read earlier in verse one where Abraham responded. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Now the text says it was the next morning that Abraham got up and, and went on his way and I can picture a, a sleepless night. I can picture this guy tossing and turning, getting up, lighting a candle, saying, I don't know how I can do this, Lord. I can imagine Abraham on his knees saying, if there's any other way. Do you remember Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane saying, Lord, if there's any other way, please take this cup away from me. I could imagine Abraham saying, if there's any other way, take this away from me, Lord. But like Jesus, he gets up and makes the sacrifice because that's what God called him to do. So where is God calling you to sacrifice? Your morning, your evening, your Sunday, your money, your entertainment, your comfort, your pride. Is God calling you to go and work someplace that's gonna cost you, but you're gonna at least do what he's called you to do? Maybe today you need to say, here I am, like Abraham did. Here I am, Lord, I'll go, I'll go. It's only when you start to pay the price that you start to reap the reward. However, I want you to be reminded that though we are called to sacrifice some parts of our lives, there's one sacrifice we couldn't make, but thankfully God provided, number three, the provision that he made. Yes, we're called to sacrifice our time, our resources, etc. But none of that is ever gonna make us right with God. There's only one sacrifice that can provide the cleansing and the forgiveness that God gives. And we can't make that sacrifice. No matter how much we sacrifice, it'll never be enough. 
but thank God he provided it. The Abraham story is a beautiful, beautiful picture of how God would provide the ultimate sacrifice for us so that we may be saved. The Abraham story is what we call a type, a type. In the Old Testament, we use that word uh, to explain how things foreshadowed what Jesus would do. This is a type of what Christ ended up doing fully. So as we read these passages again quickly, see if you can picture Jesus in these passages. See how these passages are showing us what Jesus would actually do. So we read, Isaac spoke up and said to his father Abraham, Father, yes my son, Abraham replied, the fire and wood are here. Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. Isaac was walking up that mountain with the wood on his back, like Jesus would walk up the mountain with a cross on his back. But I love that line that says, God will provide the lamb. God will provide the lamb, what a beautiful sentence. You and I come to God and we we can't give anything that's gonna make him accept us. No matter how beautifully holy and, and righteous we are, it's not enough. But God has provided a lamb. God has provided a lamb. It's exactly what he did here. See how he did it in Genesis chapter 22. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. Think about Jesus for a second with them arranging the wood. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Think of Jesus on that cross. He reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your son, your only son. And so Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. Keep that in your, in your mind. He sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. God provided a substitute. And this is a beautiful picture of what God would do for all children of Abraham centuries later. You and I are the ones who deserve to be nailed to the cross because of our sins. But God provided a sacrifice. The dear Lamb of God. Have you heard it in our songs today? We sang, the battle was yours and the blessing is mine. Jesus died, the blessing is ours. We sang, on that cross where Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. He died, we don't face his wrath. We sang, it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctified me. He died, we go free. We sang, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the lamb that was slain. He is the lamb. We sang, through your love and through the ram you saved the son of Abraham. And then we sang, your most awesome work was done through the frailty of your son. Jesus is the provision. Jesus is the provision. Do you have this in your mind, friends? I know for many of us, we've heard this many times. But oh, hallelujah, let's think of it again today that though we deserve to be on the cross, God provided the lamb so that we didn't have to die. Peter said it this way in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter one. He said, you know, it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed. You can't pay your way into God's good books. It was not with silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Jesus died as the lamb. They knew exactly what he meant when he said that, the Jews who would have read this. Because remember, Peter was an apostle to the Jews. Christ died as our substitute. He is our provision. The question is, do you know this and have you believed this and placed your faith in him? When you stand before God one day, are you going to say, this is what I've done? Or are you gonna say, All that I can say is this is what Jesus did for me. I didn't provide anything to get into your good books, Lord, but Jesus provided a way. Are you still trying to get right with God by providing your own own righteousness? By saying, Lord, 
here's how good I've been? Or are you saying he provided my salvation, he alone, by dying as my substitute? You know what, friends? You can be as religious as you like. You can come to church every week. You can serve on the board. You can get baptized. You can take communion. You can volunteer. You can do outreaches. Please do. These are all wonderful things to do. But if you're relying on that for God to to welcome you, you've got it all wrong. It's only by looking on Jesus, looking at Jesus on the cross and saying, he's my substitute, he's my provision. Save me, Lord, by what you've done and not by what I've done. That's the only way to be saved. And so Abraham's test ultimately was a picture of the love of God. It was a picture of the dear Lamb of God who died in our place. And not just to die on the cross, but to be raised again in power, number four. The power of God was the great result of this test that Abraham went through. It fascinates me that Abraham seemed to believe that God would raise Isaac from the dead. Look at that verse in verse five. We will worship, he said, to the servants. Me and the boy are gonna go up the mountain, we're gonna worship, and then we will come back to you. He didn't say, I'll come back. He didn't even leave it out so that they didn't have to worry about it. He said, we'll worship and then we'll be back. He was convinced that God was gonna raise Isaac from the dead. In fact, that's what the New Testament says. Look at what the writer to the Hebrews says to explain this. He says, by faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. But Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead. And so in a matter of speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. Abraham reasoned that God would raise his son from the dead. Even all these years later, Abraham was still trusting in God as El Shaddai. He said, if I present the sacrifice, God is all powerful and all sufficient. And he he will still make Isaac the one through whom my offspring come. I don't know how he's gonna do it, but he'll do it. And so friends, as the Abraham story comes to a close, it's all about, it all comes back down to the power of God doing what he said he was gonna do from the beginning. Maybe the tests we go through are opportunities to keep trusting, to keep believing, to keep knowing that God is El Shaddai, all powerful. Even if he does things we didn't think he would do, he's still going to make his promises come to fruition. 2024 is coming to a close. It's been a testing year for many of us. Maybe you're looking back saying, yo, this year has tested me. That's okay. The promise of God is not just to bless us, it's to test us, to have us grow. And to do well in his test, we must be willing to pay a price. It's only when we sacrifice that we start to get anywhere. God will provide. He provides a way out. He provides a way forward. And ultimately, he'll provide, well, ultimately, he's provided the lamb so that you can be saved. And his power is great. He's El Shaddai from beginning to end. I got 54% for that test. And... It was my favorite mark ever. You know what, all you need is a, is a mustard seed. Do you remember when Jesus said all you need is the, is the faith the size of a mustard seed? You don't need to have it 100%. You don't need to have the perfect faith because then none of us would be saved. All you've gotta do is have that mustard seed of faith in God's promise, his provision, and his power. You can pass your test. Abraham did. It'll be your story too. Come, let's pray. Father, we thank you today for a beautiful story in your word reminding us of some wonderful truths. We thank you today that you're the God who promises to bless us but doesn't just hand it to us on a plate. Lord, as we think about the tests we're going through. We stand in faith and say we trust you to test us. We trust you to test us because we want to prove ourselves to you. Not to try to earn your love, but because you've already loved us. 
And so help us to go back into our testing times with faith and to pay a price if we need to. Father, you call us to enjoy life or you've, you've allowed us to enjoy life. We're not supposed to live lives of misery. But certainly you've called us to sacrifice even things we love so that we can be closer to you. We're not gonna hurt anybody, but we're certainly gonna make, pay the price that we have to, Lord, whether it means changing our routine, changing our lifestyle, doing whatever we have to do that we may be close to you. But thank you, Lord, that the ultimate sacrifice was provided. We know that we don't have to do all these things to earn your approval. We know that the only way to be saved is through faith in the provided Lamb of God. And we thank you and we worship you for Jesus, our provision. And Lord, we stand before you now saying, we've got nothing that will earn our way except faith in the provided Lamb of God. And we worship you for your power to raise him from the dead and to make sure that your promises still go forward. Father, thank you that even the mustard seed faith can pass the test. Thank you that we don't need to have it perfect, but that we just need the bare minimum, really, to move forward. And so go with us back into our days and into this Christmas season with a deep faith in you, El Shaddai. And as we've journeyed with Abraham all these weeks, we thank you for who he was, the powerful example he was for us as a man of God. Bless us this Christmas season as we see Jesus not only as the lamb, but as the baby in the manger. And remind us all over again that you're the God who provides in special ways. We worship you, we praise you. In the precious name, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, amen.